right, good morning. Welcome to those of you that are here in Phoenix. I know you get so tired of me saying that, but I really, really am glad. We have a couple new people today, so we're glad you're with us. For those of you that are watching us online or apps or Roku or YouTube or any way you found us, we're glad you're with us today too. I always tell you this, if you want to know more about our ministry, go online to womensbiblestudy.com. Everybody here gets handouts. The handouts are on online, so you can uh, get those and follow along with us. And uh, that's what we do. We are in a series in Acts, which I'll explain in a second. But first, I want to say thank you to those of you that wished me a happy birthday. Okay, my birthday was on Sunday. There you go. Everybody wrote things on Facebook, and it's so cute. And um, I'm one of those people that, like, birthdays just, like, panic me. So I just would rather, and, like, I don't, don't want anyone to know. But unfortunately, Facebook doesn't make that availability. So, or maybe they do. I'm going to try to figure that out next week, so no one, next year. So, so no one knows it's my birthday. But I am the only person that looks forward to my birthday. And there's one reason why, and that is because my mom, makes me my mother's chocolate cake. Okay, so that's what she does. And, and so I'm always excited to have my birthday for that exact reason. So she invited uh, Rob and I over for dinner on Sunday night for my birthday. And I really thought it would be my mom and my dad and my sister. I'm sorry, my mom and dad, Rob and I, four of us. Well, when I get there, my sister and her husband are there and my brother and, and his wife is there. And the first thing I do when I get to my mom's is look around for my cake, just to see if she made it for me, okay? Well, I didn't see it, so it kind of made me sad, but then she brought it out. But then I realized that I had a problem. Now I have to share it, okay? <laughs> so I said, do I really have to share my cake with you? And they said, well, that would be the nice Christian thing to do. So the next day, I took over the left, I had an entire half of the cake. You got to see this. This is me studying, okay? Which after I saw that, I thought, wow, I have a really messy desk, but that's my cake, okay? I ate it all day, okay? All day, yep. Because that's what I think people have to study that way. That's the, that's the best way to study when you have a cake sitting right beside you. All right, we are in a new series, and I say that like sort of, because we're really not, but we have a different set. And what we're doing is we're going through the book of Acts, and we're going very, very slowly. But because we're going so slowly, you guys are all getting sick of the same set. So here's what this looks like, especially if you're watching us online. Acts is a huge, huge book. It's going to take one, two, three, four, five, five actual sets to get through this, this particular series. So here was the first one, Acts 1 through 7. Lessons 1 through 7 is on this series, Acts, the power that turned the world upside down, because this is when the Holy Spirit comes upon this, on the scene and uh, gives everyone the power to live this Christian life. Then the second series we did was All In. It had lessons 8 through 18. It's kind of like this whole idea that when you become a Christian, you got to be all in. That's where we went on that. We just now finished up last week, Why Did God Save Me? That's Acts Lessons 19 through 28. Uh, so you kind of see this progression here that we're going through Acts. And so today we are starting our outrageous faith. There you go. Over here, if you see this, this was supposed to go up on the back wall but here, but it didn't make any sense, so it has to be together. So you can kind of see that picture there. And, and what it's all about is now we're seeing the disciples going out and doing really amazing things that takes outrageous faith, like believing God for a miracle. And that's where we're going to go today. Now, for, for the last many, many weeks, we've been talking about Saul, who we know as the Apostle Paul. And we have been talking about um, his amazing, amazing conversion. And when we started in Acts, Saul wasn't even on the scene, but Peter was and uh, John and, you know, the, the earlier disciples, they were on the scene. And then um, we were coming back to Peter today, which is kind of interesting. It, it feels like Peter went on vacation, but he really kind of didn't. Uh, this made me laugh. Linda went on vacation. She was playing a slot machine, first time at a casino. She wasn't sure how the machines operated, so she asked one of the workers. She said, excuse me. She said, how does this work? And so he came over and showed her how to you know, put the bill in and then hit the spin button and then pull all whatever needed to be done. And she said, well, where does the money come out? And he smiled and said, well, usually see over there that ATM machine? <laughs> That's usually where the money comes out. <laughs> But we're back to Peter, and for those of you that don't remember Peter, Peter was um, the one who denied Jesus three times. He was one of Jesus' inner circle, Peter, James, and John. He, he, at the very end, you know, he says, Jesus, I'll follow you anywhere, and Jesus is like, yeah, not going to happen. You're going to deny me. He ends up denying Jesus, and um, 
And then after Jesus rises from the dead, suddenly it all comes together for him and it makes total sense. And so he, he really decides at that point he's going to follow Jesus. Uh, the Pentecost happens. He's empowered by the Holy Spirit, uh, preaches to a crowd of 3,000 that get saved that day. So he, he does this in front of Romans that want to kill him and Jewish elite religious people. So and there's a huge change in Peter's life. But we haven't seen Peter for quite a few weeks now. And, um, but we have to realize that, that when, when um, Luke is writing Acts, we told you this last week, it encompasses 32 years. So we're talking 32 years in this entire book. And so it started out with Peter. It showed us now the conversion of Saul. Now we are back to Peter because both of these men were, were hugely a, a big part of this early, early church. All right, if I can turn the page, we can tell you where we're at. All right. Today, I want to talk about something that we've probably talked about in one of those past lessons in, um, in Acts. So if I repeat myself, it was probably so long ago that you forgot too. So um, here's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about miracles because I think all of us somehow need or want a miracle in our life. <coughs> we either need a, our marriage fixed or our kid fixed or our, you know, a job or a healing or whatever it is we need. We need some kind of a miracle for God, from God. Um, but I want to talk today about why. why. Why does God even do miracles? Like, what was the point to it in the early church? So I want to pick up on Acts 9.32. We're going to start here. Now it came to pass, as Peter went through all parts of the country, that he also came down to the saints who dwell in Lydda. Now, Peter was on the move. I'll show you. Here's the, the little map here. We see in Jerusalem, of course, was Pentecost. Uh, then we saw him go up to Samaria, and now we see him go down to Lydda. So today we're gonna, he's going to be in Lydda, and he's going to be Joppa, because I always want you to know these are real places in Israel. But he takes the message of salvation, but along with that, things are happening here you go, verse 33. There he found a certain man named Aeneas who had been bedridden eight years and was paralyzed. And Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus the Christ heals you. Arise and make your bed. And then he arose immediately. This was a huge miracle. Think about it. You're paralyzed for eight years and now you suddenly can get up and walk. Someone once said this, Miracles don't happen every day, because if they did, they would be called regulars, not miracles. And I thought that's a really, really great point. But we see a lot of miracles in Acts, but in reality, I want you to realize that miracles are kind of extremely rare. And they're, they were extremely rare in Bible times. Um, and this is why I think that it is, is because there's something completely out of the norm. God created this world with laws, with laws of nature, with like gravity, thermodynamics, and most things in this world work that way. So he created people. He created people with, with really, really smart brains. He created um, us with, with abilities to do things. So what happens is God most often works through the laws of nature that he created. Now, I told you this cute story before. I probably told it last week and just don't even remember, but I don't think so. But here, we'll try it again. There was a little kitten that climbed up a tree, it proves a point, uh, climbed up a tree in a pastor's backyard, and he tried to get the kitten down, and of course the kitten didn't want to come down, he didn't know what to do, so he backed up his truck, and he tied the branch that the kitten was sitting on, and he pulled the truck out, and thinking that the branch would come down, and then he would go, here kitty, and bring him down, but instead, as he was doing that, the rope broke and catapulted the little kitten phew, way up into the sky. And he didn't know what to do, so he went running around to all of his neighbors. Have you seen the kitten? Have you? No, no one saw it. So he finally said, God, I'm committing the kitten to you because I have no idea what happened to it. So a couple days later, he was at the grocery store, and he saw a woman who goes to his church, and he knows she hates cats, but here she was buying cat food. And she, he went up to her and he said, why do you have cat food? Like, why are you buying cat food? And she said, Pastor, you're not even going to believe this. Okay, you, you're not even going to believe this. He said, my daughter has wanted a cat for so long. She's begging, begging, and I keep telling her, absolutely not. So one day she begged me so much that I said, look, if God gives you a cat, like just gives you a cat, you can have it. She goes, no sooner did she go out, got on her knees in my yard, and I'm looking out the window saying, oh, that poor child. And I realized that she's praying for a cat, and pastor, you're not going to believe this. <laughs> Here comes a kitten flying out of the air and just <laughs> plopped onto the, right in front of my daughter. So anyway, my point to that is this. 
most of the time we see God work through normal everyday occurrences. And just like that, like she thinks it's a miracle, but of course something happened on the other end of it that we didn't know about. We see this with, with God who creates brilliant people who come up with like penicillin or, you know, hopefully someday a cure for cancer. I mean, they're not miracles. They're just God has used people and, and he puts things into their, their brains. I think of medical technology. My grandfather died of pretty much the same thing that my dad has, but my dad's lived like so much longer and will continue to live longer because there's just so many things that God has allowed and given people. So you kind of see how that goes. Some people like, you know, you need a miracle. Uh, you need your bill paid. And so your small group gets together and takes a collection and helps pay your APS bill that month. So it, you need a miracle, but he uses people to do that. Let's say you need a miracle for your marriage. And then someone comes along and says, hey, I've got this marriage uh, counselor that I think you should see and we'll pay for it. So you see how that works? Like we all need miracles, but God usually uses what goes on in, in just everyday work. God works naturally through people to get his, um, his work done. Now, here's what I need you to know. Please do not hear me say that miracles do not happen. I know that's where you're going. You're like, please don't believe in miracles. That's not true. I believe full heartedly in miracles. I have no problem. I think God does do that, but I do actually think they're probably rarer than most people think. Here's why. Miracles defy the laws of nature. That's just what a miracle is. It's something that goes completely against what, is, what, what, the, what, the, um, what God has created this world to be. Are you guys freezing? Okay. I just see people putting on jackets. <laughs> when people do that, I just, I, I, just some, I guess, I don't know if one, one to tell her or not, or if you're not hot or cold, or I don't know what to, to do with that half the time. So um, anyway, miracles defy the laws of nature, and we see it all through the Bible. For let's just say there's a donkey in the Bible that actually starts speaking, speaking like we would say English, but whatever language it was back at the time. He just started speaking. And now that defies the laws of nature. You have Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who get thrown into this fiery furnace that should have like burned them up in five seconds of, of even getting near that. And yet God protects them and, and they don't even get singed or burned or nothing. They, they get out. See, it defies nature. You have Daniel in, in a den of lions thrown in there so that the lions would eat them, eat him. But the problem is, is that lions, hungry lions will eat people. But God went in and shut the mouth of the lions so that when Daniel was in there with them, they didn't eat him. They couldn't because it was, it was a miraculous, it defied the laws of nature. We see there's a point in the Bible where the sun and the moon actually stood still for an entire day for a battle to be won. Defies the laws of nature. We see water coming out of a rock. Well, that's not normal. Do you see how that works? So when, when there's miracles that defy what, what God has created the world to be like, for us today, it would be like the cancer. Like you have it, you go get another scan, you've been praying, and then it's gone. It's just eradicated from your body, and you're just like, that's a miracle. You have a blind man who's been you know, prayed for and prayed for, and suddenly he opens his eyes and he can see. Or, or let's say you're getting ready to get hit by a car and, and an angel shoves this other car out of the way you know, to miss you. These are just things that are just not normal. Here's what it is. These are things that happen outside of the laws of nature. Now, here's what we need to know about miracles. There's always, always a purpose for miracles. And here it is, to draw people's attention to God and his message. That's the purpose for miracles. It's not to make you happy or to make your life better or whatever, but it really is to promote God. Chuck Swindoll makes a great point. He said, not all miracles, but, but quite a few of them, most of them, I would say, were were. Um, limited to three relatively short, extremely, extremely important eras in the Bible. The first era is this, we know this, is with, with, with Moses. All right, so up until Moses, we don't see a lot of miracles. I mean, there could have been some here and there, but not to the extent that it was with Moses. The Israelites are stuck in Egypt. They've been there for 400 years. I don't know that there were any miracles happening in those 400 years. And, and so he comes on the scene, and now suddenly we see the most amazing miracles of the Bible. And we see the Nile turns to blood and a, and a staff, that, a wooden staff that turns into a literal snake. Well, that's, that's not normal. You see the death of every Egyptian firstborn. Well, how does that happen? That's not normal. Um, you see God parts the Red Sea. You see them, him feeding manna for 40 years straight. Their shoes never wore out. So you see these things, they're, they're, they're miraculous events. 
They defied the laws of nature. But we have to remember, 400 years before that, we didn't see any really any miracles going on in the Bible. Like I said, if they were, they were very, very rare. Um, and before that, God just seemed to be silent. So when miracles begin to happen in the Bible, it's always because God is trying to show his people something. He's showing up. He's ready to do something. He's ready for, for people to understand who he is. And in the case of Moses, is that these were huge dramatic miracles that pointed people to the one true God. God was getting ready to be on the move. He was getting ready to say, like, it's time to get you guys out of Egypt. We're going back into the, getting into the promised land, into Israel, because here's what's going to happen. We're going to build this nation through the lineage of this family line. Will come Jesus, the Savior of the world. It all ties in. But remember, these Israelites were in Egypt for 400 years. They didn't even know who God was. They'd heard of him, but nothing was happening. So he throws this huge amounts of miracles going on that, that, that can't be anything but God to try to point the Israelites to the one true God. Then the second era uh, comes in uh, next is Elijah and Elisha. This is about 800 years later. Now, like I said, in between, there's a few miracles, maybe here and there, but nothing like these particular time periods. Once the Israelites did get into their land, they were not very good. They, uh, they, they didn't really follow God. They, they started worshiping idols and following pagan gods. And, and so at this particular time, uh, from Elijah and Elisha, God had a reason, and this is what, why all the miracles were happening, and that was to bring the Israelites back to God. And so we see where there's like no rain, there's this drought. And, and, and because of that, God feeds Elijah by, by ravens, birds. They fly in in the morning with his food. Now, that's not even normal. But suddenly we see miracles coming on the scene. We, we see God raising a widow's son from the dead. We see he provides food for this widow and Elijah in the most miraculous way. And it's just like the jar just keeps producing, you know, for them. And, and, and then he, Elijah calls down fire and it happens. And then he prays for rain after the drought. And there's this monster, you know, scene where, where all the rain is pouring down. And then you have Elisha, and, um, and he, you know, you see an axe, fled, axe, axe head floating. You see Naaman is healed. I mean, you see all these miracles coming in, and the question is, why? And here's why. God shows up with miracle after miracle to get the Israelites' attention to draw them back to God. So we're kind of seeing a theme here, that when miracles happen, there's a reason for it. It's always to promote God. Then we have another 400 years after that, and then there's 400 years of silence between the Old Testament and the New Testament. No one hears from God. Like, there's nothing going on that we know of. Like I said, there could be here and there, but it wasn't anything like these two big eras where, where God was trying to get their attention until this. Jesus comes along and the early church where we are in Acts. And Jesus shows up with some of the most amazing miracles we've ever seen. Feeds the 5,000 with a, 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 what, a loaf of bread and a fish or two. He raises people from the dead. He heals the blind. He makes lame men walk. He makes deaf people hear. He turns water to wine. Okay, that's outside of the norm. Demons are called out of men and women. A virgin gives birth to God. Like, th these are some unbelievable miracles. Then Jesus dies on a cross, but he rises from the dead, and, and days later, 40 days later, he ascends into heaven like a balloon. Like, people just don't do that. But it's this whole period of, of miracles and miraculous events because God is trying to get their attention. And these miracles continue on in Acts. We're continually seeing miracles, just like we did with Annas, who's been bedridden for nine year, or eight years, and now he's healed. I think the reason why all these things are happening is so that it's almost God's way of saying, I want you to know that, that these things are happening because something's happening that I need you to know, and that's Jesus. Jesus is who he says he is, God in the flesh. See, this is the reason for the miracles, to point people to Jesus. We've got to know this. There's always, always a purpose for miracles. Here's a, a funny little story. A man needed a miracle. An Amish man lived on a really quiet rural area. And, uh, and the problem is, is that, you know, tourists started realizing that this little Amish neighborhood was there. So, so they would drive out, but they would drive really fast, and they were killing this Amish man's chickens. 
And so like six chickens a day would die. So he finally went to the sheriff and he said, Sheriff, you got to do something. He said, my chickens are being killed. And he said, would you put up a sign? So the sheriff came out and he put up a sign, slow, school crossing. Well, it didn't help. Chickens were dying. People were going fast. They weren't paying any attention. So he called the sheriff again. The sheriff came out with a different sign. Slow, children at play. Still no difference. Chickens are dying. And the man's frustrated. The Amish man says, can I put up my own sign? And he said, absolutely. So he never heard back from the, from, the sheriff never heard back from him for about three weeks. Three weeks later, the sheriff says, I better go out and see what sign he put up that's stopping all these people. Here you go. <laughs> there you go. Slow, nudist colony. That's stopping all the people. See, that's slowing. And now the chickens are living. So here you go. <laughs> Here's the problem with miracles in the time of any one of these, these time periods, but mostly this particular time, is that people want to see the supernatural. And they want to see Jesus do something miraculous. And they wanted Jesus to do a miracle to prove who he was and all of this. But Jesus knew this about people. They want to show. They don't really want to believe. And I think that's so true today. How many of, if I could, I could even take, people know people who really have, have gotten miracles in their life. Somebody actually, you know, was healed of cancer. And yet the people around them is like, oh yeah, that's awesome. It doesn't do anything. It doesn't point them to Jesus. Nothing. They don't, want, they don't really want to know. They just want to see a sign. And it's exactly what was going on with Jesus. Look what Jesus says here. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name, identifying themselves with him. Why? After seeing his signs, his attesting miracles, which he was doing. But Jesus, for his part, did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and understood the superficiality and fickleness of human nature. He did not need anyone to testify concerning man and human nature, for he himself knew what was in man in their hearts, in the very core of their being. In other words, Jesus is saying, I'm not really going to devote myself to most of these people because I know they're just in it to, for themselves, for the show, for whatever it is. Here's the next one with Nicodemus. Now, there was a certain man among the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler, member of the Sanhedrin, among the Jews, who came to Jesus at night, said to him, Rabbi, teacher, we know without any doubt that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs, these wonders, these attesting miracles that you do, unless God is with him. Do you see what's going on? They got that. Some of the people really understood that these miracles had a purpose. Here's what happened. Miracles did what they were supposed to do, caused people to believe in Jesus. But they wanted to see the miracles, but they never ended up believing in Jesus. There's two different things right there. Miracles did to some people what they were supposed to do, caused them to believe in Jesus. But there's the other people that, you know what, they saw the miracles and never, ever ended up believing in Jesus at all. Here's what I do want to say. There will be another, mir uh, another era where there will be miracles. Uh, the Bible talks about it. It's going to be in the end times. The problem is, is these miracles that will happen are not going to be from God. They will be from Satan. And they're going to look like it, and you and I are going to have to know the difference. There's false miracles and true miracles. One is from God. One is going to be very deceptive from Satan. He'll bring the Antichrist on the scene. The Antichrist will be able to do signs and wonders. Look at here. For false Christs and false prophets will arise, show great signs and wonders, so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. He's telling us in advance, be very, very careful what you're hearing and what you're seeing, because it, it might not be me. Behold, I have told you in advance. So if they say to you, behold, he's in the wilderness. If you get a phone call, I heard Jesus is in the wilderness. I heard you need to go out there. He's saying, yeah, don't believe him. Behold, he's in the inner room. Hey, he's at this conference. Jesus is at the healing conference. Here you go. Do not believe him. It's really, really important for us to know that. Chuck Swindoll gives four ways that if, to, to, for us to know if miracles are from Satan or if they really are from God. We're going to go through them. Here's the first one. Is God alone exalted, not a man or a woman? You've got to really start thinking about this. If somebody is promoting themselves and saying, I can do this miracle for you, be very, very wary of that. Brian Jones, who wrote a couple books, one of them, of course, is my favorite book, Second Guessing God, he said an, one time he went on a personal retreat when he first started ministry. He said he spent a day meditating on the temptations Jesus faced in, in Luke 4. He said that day 
He read about how Satan tried to get Jesus to throw himself off the temple and then the, the angels will scoop him up and in front of all the Jewish people and that's how you know, Satan said, you know, that's how you'll get all the attention. But Jesus ignored uh, Satan and said, leave. I want nothing to do with you, Satan. I'm not doing that. And for some reason in Brian's mind, it just clicked into him that said this, he said, I realized that Jesus took three years in pretty much obscurity. He didn't make himself known. He wasn't trying to make himself known. He, you know, he wandered along. In fact, he told most people, don't tell anyone I just healed you. Don't tell anyone I did this. Like it was never, ever about, you know, Jesus trying to promote, like I'm the great healer. None of that. It was very, very obscure. And Brian said he realized that, that he made a vow to God that for 10 years he would try to do his ministry in complete obscurity because he knew that it would take that long to prepare his heart to be the kind of leader that he was supposed to, to, to lead. And this is what he needed to make distinctions for. Is what I am doing self-promotion or promoting God's message? And so we all have to figure that out in our own lives. If what I am doing is it just trying to promote me or is it really, really trying to promote God? And that could be our businesses, that could be our hobbies, that could be whatever we're doing in our life. What are we doing? Do I want to write a book so that people can know me? Do I want to teach a Bible study so people can know me? Or do I really honestly want to promote God's message? And every one of us have to determine that in our life. Selfish ambition, ambition versus pursuing God's calling. Am I doing this selfishly? Am I up here doing this selfishly? Or do I really believe this is God's calling on my life? There's a difference. Corporate manipulation versus casting God's vision. You can get all these big churches together and try to do it, but is it really God's vision? Or is it a corporate thing? Or this building my own platform form versus allowing God to build a platform for me if he so choose. Huge difference. And so you have, um, we, we have to always ask ourselves, who is promoting the miracles? Are they promoting themselves? Are they promoting a ministry? And the other thing you need to ask is, will this miracle cost you money? If someone says, come to our healing center and, and pay a certain amount of money, and we're going to pray that, you know, and we'll see, uh, we have to be very, very, very careful of that. It doesn't cost, it. God doesn't charge money for healing. He just doesn't do that. I thought this was cute. There's a guy who kind of wants to be known for his soon-to-be money. Elderly man on a beach found a magic lamp. He picked it up and a genie appeared and said, because you've freed me, you can have one wish. The man thought for a moment and said, my brother and I had a fight 30 years ago. He said, he's never forgiven me and so I, I, my wish is that he would forgive me. There was a thunderclap and the genie declared, your wish has been granted, but before I continue, I want to know why. Like, are you old and you're dying and, and you just, you know, you, you just want, you know, forgiveness for your brother? And he said, no, not really. He said, but my brother's old and dying and he's worth $60 million. <laughs> yeah, it'll take a while to get that one. It's fine. <laughs> this is how you know that God is, um, is in the miracles. It's when God is exalted. Never, ever a man or a woman or a ministry. Here's the second one. There's no showmanship. It's not like the greatest showman out there just trying to be something that, you know, we live in a world where we have like healing rallies and big productions and healing conferences and, and there's all of this showmanship going on. And the problem with these places is that many of the people that are running these shows are making a lot of money and they're building big homes and they're buying jets. And they're doing all this kind of stuff and, and it's self-promotion is what, what really it is. I want to read uh, together. We'll put this on the screen. This is written by Peter Glover. He talks about Mark Havill. Um, he, has a, a, he used to be involved in this whole health and wealth healing uh, word of faith movement. And so he's, we're going to ask some questions, and we're just going to put it up on the screen because I want you to see how, how this works. I just want to do this, and I don't even know if I'm allowed to do this, but I'm doing it anyway, um, because I want to be careful, us to be careful that, that we have to be able to distinguish between showmanship and uh, reality. From Faith to Faith in Christ by Peter Glover, Mark Havel's An Extraordinary Story. Converted into the Pentecostal Charismatic Church, he quickly came under the spell of the word faith teaching of men like Kenneth Copeland. Things did not stay that way for Mark. Still in his mid-20s, Mark became an, became an itinerant minister traveling the country, earning large sums of money through his ability to perform signs and wonders. 
Remarkably, he has renounced his former life, his beliefs, his practices as a word faith minister, and is now speaking out boldly against the beliefs and practices of the current signs and wonders movement. How did you first get involved with word faith? He said, well, I was given a lot of tapes and books by Kenneth Copeland, which everyone was into at my church in North London. I believe that my Christian experience could validate, validate my faith. It convinced me that what, I was, um, that what I was in was real. I was impressed by the numbers involved, their interest in the media, publications, the money, the general trappings of success. It bred the belief in me that biggest must be best. How did you use what you saw in this material? He said, basically, I copied it. I learned gradually to do what all these speakers like Copeland, Corello, Benny Hinn, and, and others do. They manipulate audiences and individuals simply by the power of suggestion. They call the results signs and wonders. They're deluded. Gradually, I too had learned the process of controlling meetings and inducing hypnotic techniques through suggestion in churches. I did many of the so-called signs and wonders. Um, you maintain that you were able to induce an atmosphere that was conducive to hypnotic suggestion. He said, absolutely. Techniques are no different than those used by a practicing hypnotist. First, the people in these meetings are already coming with high expectancy. They want it to be God. Second, you need to create the right atmosphere. Hence, the long periods of singing certain types of songs to make people feel relaxed and warm. Will it affect everyone in the meeting? Nope, not at all. If you do not believe that it is God that is doing these things in the meeting, there is no way you will fall down. But remember, I'm the one running the show. Just like any good hypnotist, I will be working the audience. I can tell which ones are the more suggestive by asking certain questions. I can bring people forward, having gotten them into a very relaxed and accepting state. You have to remember, people who come really want to believe that God is at work. By telling them to stand in a particular place, I am strongly influencing their belief that by standing where I have told them on that exact spot, something is going to happen. By telling them someone will stand behind them because we wouldn't want them to get hurt if they fall, it is all heightening the sense of anticipate, anticipation and suggestiveness. The rest, he said, is easy. You seem to find it difficult to watch yourself on screen. He said, yeah, I find it very hard knowing how I unconsciously deceived good people into believing that the Holy Spirit was at work when it was common or garden hypnosis. At the same time, I suppose I did believe, however incorrectly, that these things were the activity of God. But the reality is I learned these techniques by watching others, and anyone can do them given enough training. They're psychological techniques, nothing else. What caused you to look again at what you were doing and believed? He said, in a nutshell, the scriptures themselves. I decided that I wanted to learn the scriptures in the original Greek, and I began to realize that what I believed didn't match up with what the scriptures actually taught. For instance, well, in 1 Corinthians, it didn't say we would be given spiritual gifts on demand, but as God wills. This is really important. There's people out there that will tell you, you know, um, like, let's just say, if I say, I want the gift of speaking in tongues, so I need you to pray that I get the gift of speaking in tongues, and I think that I should be able to do that because you're going to pray that over me, and I just believe that. Well, the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible actually says God gives specific people specific gifts. I have the gift of teaching. I don't have the gift of speaking in tongues. You may have the gift of speaking in tongues, and you may not have the gift of teaching. It, it just kind of, everyone, Chris has a gift of mercy. I don't have that at all. We know that. But, but what I'm saying is you can pray that into my life and try it. You know, go for it. But it's, it's, God manifests himself through the different gifts that he gives people so that we're one big body. We all have different things. So when you go to these meetings and I say, well, I want to speak in tongues and I want to be slain in the spirit and all that stuff. Well, it's not something that God it's not his deal for me. So we got to kind of look differently past this. But if you're raised in a very charismatic church, you're going to be really mad at me. I get that, whatever. Um, he said, I had always been taught that with enough faith, if you were anointed and prayed enough, you would manifest the relevant gifts. And I could see that God really didn't work that way. He really doesn't. And, and you've got to really study the scripture to be able to understand that. That God says, I give all these different gifts. Romans 12 um, and uh, 1 Corinthians 12 are all the spiritual gifts. And he gives them all to different people. It's not one. It, you, he just, that's just the way he does this whole thing. But, but we can get sucked into things like this. Um, John Piper wrote uh, on this, uh, this whole idea of the signs and wonder movement. He said, here's the problem. We forget this, that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation, not signs, not wonders, not gifts of the Spirit. It's the gospel. And that's our job. What are any spiritual gifts supposed to do? Not make me bark like a dog and not make me like fall over and be slain in the spirit. That's not what it's about. It's about Jesus and getting people to know him. That's what's important. 
And that's what we have to remember, that the, the signs and wonders do weird stuff. Here's the next verse. He says, uh, Jews demand signs, Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified the power of God. See, that's what we don't want to seek signs for, for, for things like this. We, we need to realize it's all about Jesus. 1 Corinthians says this, the word of the cross is the power of God. It's all about the cross of Jesus. Here's what, he, what Piper says, sign seeking is a diversion from the power of Christ crucified. And when you go to these meetings and it's all about signs and wonders and doing things and getting all hyped up, you're missing the whole point. Where's Jesus? It's all about Jesus being crucified and, and, and that's the power for us. Jesus says this in Matthew 12, 39 and 16, 4, that Jesus said, an evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign. We have to be really careful. Any sign, any wonder, any healing, any miracle, anything is only there to point people to Jesus. Never to elevate a man or line his pocketbook. We got to get that. There's no showmanship involved. And we'll see that with Peter today. We see that in Acts 9 here with Aeneas. There he found a certain man named Aeneas. I wish I could know how to say his name right. Who had been bedridden eight years. Peter said, Jesus the Christ heals you. Arise, make your bed. And then he rose immediately. And, and that's, he gave all the glory, glory to God. Third, here's how you know a miracle is from God. Unbelievers are convinced to believe. We see that why did Jesus heal people in front of people so that other people would believe in him? Why is Peter and Paul doing this healing people through the power of the Holy Spirit? Not to make themselves known, but to really point people to Jesus. Healings and miracles were like billboards pointing their way to a relationship with God. Now he goes on, verse 35. So all who dwelt at Lydda and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. So when they saw this miracle in Lydda, they ca unbelievers came to Christ. Unbelievers didn't go to the show to try to get more miracles and try to do things for themselves. It, the miracle pointed them to Jesus and then they believed. That's the point to miracles. Here's the fourth thing. Biblical truth is validated. Miracles have to line with what the Bible says. Because remember, there's going to come a time when the Antichrist comes on the scene doing miracles. We've got to be able to, to distinguish between the two. We have to validate everything biblically. Now, we saw that Aeneas was healed, and now we're going to move down here from Lydda, and we're going to go up to Joppa. Here you go, Acts 9.36. At Joppa, there was a certain disciple named Tabitha, which is translated Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and charitable deeds, which she did. But it happened in those days that she became sick and died. When they'd washed her, they laid her up in the upper room. Since Lydda was near Joppa, and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent two men to him, imploring him not to delay in coming to him. Then Peter arose and went with them. When he had come, they brought him to the upper room, and all the widows stood by weeping, showing the tunics and garments which Dorcas had made while she was with them. But I want you to look and see what Peter did. But Peter put them all out, and he knelt down and prayed. Here's what I need you to know, is that when Peter was in this room, he could have said, go get the townspeople, bring them all in. In fact, let's pick up Tabitha's body and take her out and let's get a big crowd and let's make this big healing revival. We're going to see how God is going to raise her from the dead. Peter did no such thing. He said, everyone in this room, get out. It is between me and God and Tabitha. That's it. He wanted to know this because here's what I, I wonder. I don't know if he knew God was going to heal her. And so what he does and what you should do and what I should do is get on our knees if we need a miracle, just like Peter did, and pray. That is what we all should do when someone needs a miracle. Here's what Peter did. He prayed. He believed. He knew that God was powerful enough to raise her from the dead, but then he waited to see what God wanted to do. Because if you want to know about miracles the right way, here's what you need to know. God does what God needs to do. And sometimes our prayers for miracles end up in healing or miraculous things. But I'm going to tell you, oftentimes they don't. And you've got to really get that, that sometimes your, your prayers for miracles don't happen. And going into that, you need to know that. We had a horrible thing. We have a friend of ours, and the other night on Facebook, it, she said, my 21-year-old son just died in a car accident. 
And it was so shocking to us. We were like, you have got, like we have a 21-year-old son. And I can't even imagine how devastating that would be. But she wrote something on Facebook, and I, I wish I would have written it down. She said, my heart is broken, my life is shattered, but my faith is as strong as ever. My faith will never be destroyed. And that, that's what I'm saying. When you get God and you understand him, it, 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 as tragic as things are, the tragic is as Tabitha's death to this church because they really, really needed her. Our faith is not in the miracle. Our faith is in Jesus. And if he wants to heal that person or raise her from the dead, awesome. But no, he might not. It literally might not be his will. We prayed for, I told you this before, a 13-year-old who had cancer in our church. On my face, on my knees, nobody believed more that God would heal this kid. And he died. I can't answer that. Uh, we had, for those of you that know Cheryl Lynn and, and uh, her son Kyle, we prayed and prayed and begged God to, for God to save him from, from cancer. And he, he was about 28 years old, and God took him home. We have a lady in here that was so young. Same thing. Prayed and prayed that God would heal her, and he didn't. He took her home. I, I, those are things that just I don't even understand. But here's what I want you to know. It wasn't because we didn't have enough faith. And people are out there saying, you just didn't have enough faith. The more faith you have, that God will do. No, he won't. Faith is very important, but your, your faith can't be in faith. And your, can't, your faith can't be in ma you're making God do what you want him to do. God does what God needs to do. And if you're a follower of Christ, you come under that umbrella, and you're saying, God, my life is yours. My prayer, just like Peter, is that you will do this miracle. Heal, you know, raise Tabitha from the dead. Get me a job. Heal my son. Whatever it is. But God, here's the deal. Whatever you want to do is fine with me. Here's what you and I need to know. God's will always supersedes our prayers. We have to know that going into this. He asks us to pray and trust, and if he heals, that's awesome. And that's a way to go out and tell people your story. Jesus healed me. You need to come to know him. But if he doesn't heal, that should be awesome too. We have to learn to love Jesus regardless of whether he gives us a miracle or not. We have to learn that that's what following Jesus is all about. Jesus is not a Santa Claus in the sky. And it's not that we just go to him and say, we need you to do, he'll do what he needs to do. And for why? To promote the gospel, to get the name of Jesus out there. Because if you and I assume that he will always say yes to our, our prayers for miracles, and when he doesn't do it, it's devastating to our faith. I'm going to tell you a joke. And it literally made me laugh. I cried. This is how funny this joke is. All right. But none of you are going to get it. Okay, so I just know that. So you got to really think about this. And, and no one's going to think it's funny, but I think I was really tired when I read it and I found it. So here it is. Here's a man who was devastated, not because Jesus didn't answer a prayer, but he was devastated because his dog, his dog got, well, he wasn't sick. His dog was cross-eyed. And so he has this big, huge Rottweiler. So he takes him to the vet, his, the owner of this big Rottweiler. And, and the vet looks at him and the, and the guy says, I don't know what to do with my dog. He's cross-eyed. What can you do? And the vet picked up this huge monster dog and looked in his eyes. And he said, well, I'm going to have to put him down. And the guy goes, you're going to have to put my dog down just because he's cross-eyed? And he goes, no, because he's really heavy. <laughs> Okay, serious, I was crying. Like, I literally, I don't know why that struck me so funny, but I was like, you can just picture it. It's like, no, I'm putting him down because he's heavy. Okay, we'll move on. I want to read a story real quick. I don't know how much time we have. I want to read a story, and I tried to get a hold of these people to get permission, and hopefully I will have permission, but if not, it'll be asking forgiveness. Abigail and Dolly, um, I'll put, tell you who it is, Abigail and Dolly blogspot.com, okay? Anyway, she, she writes blogs, and so I want to read this to you because I want you to see how devastating it is if you were taught that Jesus just gives you any miracle you want. You can talk to a lot of people in here who you've prayed and prayed for God to do things and he hasn't done it. Doesn't mean he doesn't love you, doesn't mean he not enough faith, it just means he's doing something different. And we've got to really grasp that. Here is her story. She said, recovering from the word of faith, Abigail and Dolly readers, as a new believer, I was starving for the things of God. If you followed this blog or friends with me on Facebook, you know that I have always something I am passionate about. I'm almost researching searching, and trying to find out as much as I can about my subject. 
My mom teased me about this trait this summer. I realized that there are a couple major things I usually adopt, faith, gardening, health, weight loss, cooking, and sometimes politics. This is no surprise that when I recommitted my life to the Lord that I would dig in deep, and I did. Unfortunately, in my hunger to learn everything about this wonderful life in Christ, I began watching Word of Faith preachers on INSP pre-internet world. I was enthralled. I could pray for healing and be healed. I could invest in God's kingdom and reap exponential awards. I could confess and speak things into existence because God promised in his word that he has to do it because that is who God is. I read books, I taped shows, I confessed the word, I prayed, I gave, I believed, I made terrible financial decisions based on faith. I was sold out and so on fire for the Lord. It was tough for me to, for others to be around me. Then I got sick and I prayed and I believed God for healing. I did not receive that sickness into my body. I exercised incredible faith. I did not get better. Sitting in the emergency room one night about six weeks into this mysterious illness, I looked at my husband and complained that I was doing everything I was supposed to do and I was still sick. Something was very wrong with this picture. I gave up on the Word of Faith movement in that moment. What I did not realize was that I was now very spiritually damaged. And I'm hoping that somebody is listening to this today because you can be very spiritually damaged by churches, by people, by parents, by grandparents. And, and it's how someone taught you. And you're trying desperately, a lot of you are at Bible study to say, what does the Bible say? Because I think I've kind of been not taught the right thing. She said, as a new believer, I indoctrinated my soul with lies. I set up ways of thought, beliefs, and actions based on the words of greedy liars disguised as preachers. Many ways I had black highways paved through my soul. My thoughts and prayers raced across the false rows. When I abandoned the word of faith movement, I abandoned the word of faith and the hope that comes with being a true believer. Subconsciously embarked on the rest of my, my faith life where God's promises were tainted. Having hope seemed like a mountaintop proclamation. Expending my faith was ruined. It was 15 years after the fact that I realized that I still carried the damage. Reciting scriptures of God's promises ran over those dark highways in my soul and reached my heart with unbelief and no power. I did not even realize it as I began to dig into it. I realized that only God can heal me of these spiritual scars. How many walking wounded are there right now? How many new believers are sucked into this false doctrine and scarred forever? How many huge houses went into foreclosure because vulnerable Christians were believing God for money to pay for their mortgages? How many sick people are not seeking medical treatment because they are believing God for divine healing? How many people, people completely fall away from the faith as seeds sown in shallow ground? I have been a vehement critic of the name it and claim it movement. I left the church home over a dispute about it and never looked back. I hate the doctrine or what it does, and there's a special place in hell for the wolves in sheep's clothing that deceive God's people and line their pockets with proceeds. Beware. Here's what I'm hoping that we're learning from Acts, that when you study Acts, you realize it's not about you. It really is all about getting the message of Jesus out there. And, and, and when you're sick and when you need a healing, let's just say, here's what you need to be doing. That's what this is what this looks like. God, I pray for healing, but you know what's best. Do you see what that looks like? Instead of saying, God, I expect you to do this because you say in that one verse that, that you're going to do. Instead, just, as a follower of Christ, you're like, my life is yours. God, I really pray for healing. You know I need it. You know I want it. I'm begging you. You're a good father. I'm praying. I'm telling you exactly what I need. But here's the deal. You know what's best for me. How about this, God, I pray for healing, but if me being sick will bring people to you, then don't heal me. Do you see the difference there? It's really all about him. How about this, God, I pray for your healing, but I want your best, whatever that looks like. God, my life is about you and furthering your kingdom, not about me and furthering mine. Here's what you need to know. Should you pray for the miracle? The answer is absolutely. I'm telling you what, I'm praying for a miracle right now. We have to sell our house. And my prayer is, God, we need to sell our house before March of next year, before property taxes are due again. Now, we live in a really weird place. It's, it's in the middle of nowhere. It's, it's, it's building up out there, but it's kind of like it's, an, it's a unique house on a unique piece of property, and it's going to take a really unique buyer to buy our house. But I have this weird thing that says, I do believe God can sell it. I'm trusting him to do that. I'm praying to that end. God, we need a miracle desperately. I know he can sell it. I know there's a buyer out there for our house. But here's what I had to realize. If he doesn't, oh well. Here's why. He always sees the bigger picture. 
He just does. What if our house, because all the building going up, is worth hundreds of thousands of dollars more in two years? Why would I not want to wait for God's best? Some of you are trying to, you know, I want a husband, but no guys are coming around. Well, here's the deal. Wait for God's best. Don't go running out there and doing something stupid just because you're fearful. Like pray, God, I want a husband. God, I want a job. God, I, but let him do what he needs to do. Fall under his authority. So Peter gets on his, on his knees to pray for Tabitha, who is lying in front of him dead. There's no crowd. There's no mourning woman. And I think his prayer was this, God, we really need Tabitha. I need a miracle. This is the early church. Tabitha is so helpful to us. We really, really desperately need her. God, I need you to raise her from the dead. And not only do we need her, but God, could you imagine if you raised her from the dead, what's going to happen? You're going to raise her from the dead, and then all these people are going to see it, and she's going to walk out alive after they saw her dead. And imagine the people that will come to you. Because that's what miracles are supposed to do. Draw people to Jesus. I think this kind of bold prayer is what God wants from us. Knowing that we know that he can and believing that he can, but also knowing that he will do whatever he needs to do. Sometimes, like I said, he does answer us the way we want and sometimes he doesn't. Some of you will say, well, that's not what I was taught because there's the verse. You can pray for anything, and if you have faith, you will receive it, Matthew 21, 22. I tell you this all the time, and I'm so desperate to get this into our brains. You have to take Scripture in context. You cannot pull a verse like that out and just say, oh, I can just get anything I want because I'm going to pray for it, and I, I have enough faith. It doesn't work. In context, that's not what that means. So you need to go study that on your own. Here's another verse if you want to understand that. Now, this is the confidence that we have in him if we ask anything according to his will. Do you see the difference? You, you can't pull one scripture out. You have to take the whole Bible and say, you know what? This is about God and his will and what I'm supposed to do in this life. I'm going to pray for things. If it's his will, he'll give it to me. If it's not, he won't. Oh, well. How awesome to live like that. There's so much peace in that. I told you last year, I told you, I think I just told this to you a couple weeks ago, my little CVS lady who was completely bent over in CVS. I don't ever pray for people like that. And, and I'm walking through the store and I'm seeing her bent over and I'm thinking, I got to pray for her. Walked back in the store, said, can I lay hands on you and pray for you? And she's like, absolutely. And I prayed, dear Jesus, please heal her, make her stand up straight. And honestly, I said, amen, and looked up thinking that she would stand up straight and she didn't. And she not only didn't, I came back that afternoon thinking it was a slow miracle. And then I went back the next day thinking she just needed a good night's sleep and then the miracle would happen then and she still was bent completely over. And it was a great lesson to me that I'm going to pray and I'm going to believe. And God does heal. But for that woman, he may have healed her a month later. Or you know what? He might be healing her on the other side of heaven. I don't know. I can't answer that. God does answer prayers, but here you go. Not always the way we think it should be answered we got to know that. I think lots and lots of miracles happen a lot more in foreign countries where there's no medicine, there's no hospitals, there's no food. These people do nothing but trust God. We don't have that here. I think miracles happen. I do think some here happen here, so please hear me that. But I do think a lot happens foreign. Here's what we need to know. God sees the big picture. Having faith doesn't always mean a yes answer. Having faith means if the answer is okay, no, it's okay because we trust that God's doing something bigger. I think Peter learned to pray from Jesus where he said, when Jesus is going to the cross, he's sitting there and he's saying, God, I don't really want to do this. Like, this is going to be painful. I don't want to be, you know, whipped and crucified and, and die on a cross. That sounds horrifying. But he always said this, but God, whatever your will is over mine, I'm going to do. And Peter understood that. Look at the next verse. And turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. He didn't know that Jesus would heal her, but he thought, you know what? I'm putting this out there and see what happens. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. What an incredible scene. Then he gave her his hand and lifted her up, and when he had called the saints and widows, he presented her alive. I mean, how awesome is that? Tabitha, someone so needed by this church, and God raised her to bed from the dead but not to make Peter a healing rock star. Not to make Peter go out and people, oh, heal me, heal me. It had nothing to do with that. It was all about getting the gospel out into the world. Why did I put this up here? Oh, this is why God healed people. 
they're so that he would know that they're placing their faith in a very big God who can heal and raise the dead. That's the point to miracles. Verse 42, and it became known throughout all Joppa. Many believed in the Lord, so they stayed in Joppa with Simon. Here's how I want to end. This is the purpose for miracles. And it's always to point people to Jesus, who is the only way to heaven. If a, if a Mormon church is producing miracles, they're false miracles from Satan. If, if the, the Muslim church is producing miracles, they're false miracles from Satan. The only miracles that matter are the ones that point people to the one and only way to God, and that is through Jesus alone. Here's where we'll end. Be careful of these things. Do not take verses out of context. You have to see the big picture of what Acts is all about. You cannot take one verse in Acts and build an entire doctrine on it. Just talking to someone about that the, the other morning. You can't take one little verse and say, well, this is, this is the norm. It's not. Acts is a whole different transition period. Here's the next one. Beware of people offering miracles if they're looking for money or promoting themselves or their ministry. Pray, believe, trust God, but trust him for his answer. And here you go. Any miracle that happens is only to promote Jesus. Here's a miracle that happened on Monday morning that I'm giving all glory to God. I ate the entire cake that day. Miracles. I love Jesus. <laughs> Let's pray. Thank you, God. Thank you that you do miracles. I pray for those in here that need miracles. But God, if you have a different plan, we, we want you to supersede anything we ever pray about because it is all about you and we want people to come to know you. Thank you, Jesus, for all that you've done. Amen.